Well, welcome back to Lesson 8 in our study of the transport layer. The course is based on the text by Jim Carose and Keith Ross, Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach. We've been talking about the transport layer for some time, and in the last few lessons in particular, we've been discussing reliable data transfer. And we've been viewing it through some models that the authors created, RDT 1.0, RDT 2.0, and so on. And each one of these takes on a new problem. The first RDT 1.0, basically the underlying network lost nothing, changed nothing, everything would go just fine as, as fast as anybody would ever need all of which are very unlikely. But nevertheless, with each iteration of the model, a new problem was introduced. First, it was the idea that bits might be corrupted in the packet on the way. And that one was resolved by simply adding a checksum to verify that the data sent was the data that was received. Then the next problem was that somehow the sending unit had to let the receiving unit know whether or not it received it and that was accomplished by adding acknowledgments and negative acknowledgments and then a new problem was introduced well what happens if the acknowledgments are corrupted and that problem was solved by adding sequence numbers to the packets so that the sending and receiving units could both know uh, what what they were looking at and in this lesson, we're going to deal with another problem, and that is, what if the segments being transferred from one into the other aren't just corrupted, but are lost? And so why don't we pick up right there? Suppose now that in addition to corrupting bits, the underlying channel can lose packets as well, which is not uncommon in today's computer networks. Two additional concerns must now be addressed by the protocol. How to detect packet loss and what to do when packet loss occurs. The use of checksumming sequence numbers, acknowledgement packets, and retransmissions, the techniques already developed in RDT 2.2, will allow us to deal with this problem. Detecting packet loss will require adding a new protocol mechanism. There are many possible approaches toward dealing with packet loss. Here we'll put the burden of detecting and recovering the lost packets on the sender. Suppose that the sender transmits a data packet and either that packet or the receiver's acknowledgement of that packet gets lost. In either case, the sender gets no reply from the receiver. If the sender is willing to wait long enough so that it is certain that a packet has been lost, it can simply retransmit the data packet. But how long must the sender wait to be certain that something has been lost? The sender must clearly wait at least as long as a round-trip delay between sender and receiver, which may include buffering in intermediate routers, plus whatever amount of time it's needed to process a packet at the receiver, also, the protocol should ideally recover from packet loss as soon as possible, which means that waiting for a worst case delay could result in a long wait until error recovery is initiated. The approach that has long been adopted in practice is for the sender to choose a time value such that the packet loss is likely, although not guaranteed, to have happened. If an acknowledgement is not received within this time, the packet is retransmitted. Note that if a packet experiences a particularly large delay, the sender may retransmit the packet even though neither the packet nor its acknowledgement have been lost. This introduces the possibility of duplicate data packets in the sender to receiver channel. However, protocol RDT 2.2 already has enough functionality with those sequence numbers to handle the case of a duplicate packet. The sender does not know whether a packet was lost, an acknowledgement was lost, or if the packet or acknowledgement was simply overly delayed. In all cases, the action is the same, retransmit. Implementing a time-based 
retransmission mechanism requires a countdown timer that can interrupt the sender after a given amount of time has expired. Be sure to make note of that countdown timer. The sender will then need to be able to start the timer each time a packet, whether it's the first time packet or a retransmission, is sent. The sender must respond to a timer interrupt, taking appropriate actions and stopping the timer. This figure 3.15 shows the sender model for RDT 3.0, a protocol that reliably transfers data over a channel that can interrupt or lose packets. This slide will show us how the protocol operates with no loss or delayed packets and how it handles lost data packets. Time moves forward from the top of the diagram toward the bottom of the diagram. Note that a receive time for a packet is necessarily later than the send time for a packet as a result of transmission and propagation delays. The send side brackets indicate the times at which a timer is set and later times out. Because packet sequence numbers alternate between 0 and 1, Protocol 3.0 is sometimes known as the alternating bit protocol. All right, let's watch this action. In this first example, it is a complete transmission with no packet loss. Packets are sent, they're acknowledged. Notice the alternating bits from Act 0 to Act 1. Now in this second action, there is a loss. And how is that manifested? That bracket indicates a timeout. And after that timeout, it is sent again, and it continues sending. Now in this action, we're going to see what happens when there's an acknowledgment lost. Packet 1 is received, but the acknowledgment is lost. It, the receiver turns out and resends packet 1. The receiver detects that this is a duplicate and resends, notice, acknowledgment 1. Now we're going to see some real confusion. In this example, packet 0 is sent and acknowledged. Packet 1 is sent and acknowledged. But before the acknowledgement arrived, the sending unit's countdown timer timed out. So as a result, the sending unit is going to retransmit packet 1. It has no idea that packet 1, in fact, did arrive retransmits packet 1, but acknowledgement 1 arrives. That's going to cause the sender to send packet 0. Packet 0 is sent, but in the meantime, the receiving unit acknowledged the 1, the duplicated packet 1, which is going to cause the sending unit to go ahead and resend packet 0. This time, though, the receiving unit is going to acknowledge packet 0, which will put the two systems back on track. Protocol RDT 3.0 is a functionally correct protocol, but it has problems. The key to its performance problem is the fact that it is a stop and wait protocol. This means that the sender sends a packet and then stops. Nothing is being accomplished now on the sending side. The receiver sends an acknowledgment or a negative acknowledgment and then waits. Now nothing is being done on the receiving side. You can see in this slide that the sender is idle for most of the transaction. In 30.008 milliseconds, the sender was sending for only 0 .008 milliseconds. There has to be a better way, and there is, and that's what we're going to get into in the next lesson. This concludes our discussion of the stop and wait protocol of the transport layer model. It was an early one. It, uh, as you can see, it evolved in from 1.0 to 3.0 before it was done. It does work. But we're, we're not only concerned with it working, we're concerned with efficiently using the resources of the network. 
And when you have devices that are idle, you're not managing those resources very well. And we're going to see the better way, starting with the next lesson. Go ahead and review your notes, review your updates to your uh, study guide, take care of any uh, business that you may have, and then come on back and we will start a discussion of uh, the next evolution of those uh, reliable data transfer protocols.